Good morning, everybody. Let me just uh, do some housekeeping here, straighten things out a little bit. Okay, I think we're ready to start. Well, uh, again, good morning. Uh, hope you had a, a good weekend. It's uh, hard to uh, enjoy things these days when uh, we're all uh, staying glued to the uh, news out of the, uh, the, the Ukraine. Clearly a David versus Goliath a kind of a biblical uh, struggle going on here of, of that kind of proportion, I think. I don't know that that's an exaggeration. Maybe it is a bit, but uh, uh, clearly uh, this has turned out to be uh, a, uh, a mammoth battle between uh, the forces of uh, democracy and freedom and uh, the forces of autocracy, uh, as uh, clearly indicated by uh, the goals of uh, uh, Vladimir P Putin, or Mad Vlad, as I've uh, come to call him. There's a lot of uh, discussion and debate about uh, what's going on in his mind and uh, how deranged he may or may not be. He could be crazy like a fox. Uh, he could be just totally insane. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, as a former KGB agent, he certainly uh, has the uh, skill sets for knowing how to keep his uh, enemies uh, guessing. And so he's uh, done a pretty good job of that. Uh, what he's doing a, a very bad job of is uh, running the, uh, the war. Uh, the Ukrainians have done uh, a remarkable job in their resistance. Uh, and now there's some uh, scuttlebutt uh, in the news uh, this morning uh, that uh, the, the West may finally be willing to uh, come up with some big fighters uh, from the old days that Poland has uh, to give to uh, Ukrainian pilots uh, to uh, uh, even up uh, things somewhat. Though obviously, uh, in terms of uh, manpower and uh, equipment, uh, uh, Russia has uh, more, more going for it. Uh, but war isn't just about manpower and uh, equipment. It's also about uh, logistics. It's about strategy. Um, and it's about uh, um, ho home, uh, uh, the, the advantage that you have uh, in, in your uh, own uh, uh, home arena. Um, and uh, so um, uh, clearly uh, this uh, is uh, not over yet. Um, uh, the markets have been hoping for a, a ceasefire, but uh, there, there may be one uh, for humanitarian needs, but uh, it's not clear that uh, we're going to get a ceasefire that then leads to a peaceful resolution of this uh, conflict. Uh, Putin has made it very clear what he wants. He wants demilitarization and denazification. Um, demilitarization means uh, that he wants to destroy Ukraine's uh, army. He wants to replace... Uh, denazification means he wants to replace the government with... Uh, uh, his own uh, uh, Nazi regime. Uh, uh, cl clearly, this is a total uh, insane propaganda in terms of uh, labeling the uh, Ukrainians as having any influence uh, by Nazi um, by Nazis. But uh, it uh, plays well uh, in Russia because uh, obviously Russia had a horrible history uh, with uh, fighting uh, Nazis, and so uh, the propaganda warfare um, seems to be still working in Putin's favor, at least uh, within Russia. But uh, the economic calamity that uh, seems to be befalling the Russian economy has uh, got to uh, have uh, some impact on uh, weakening uh, the, the home front. And of course, uh, if in fact uh, the casualty count, uh, especially on the right Russian side, uh, is correct, and that starts uh, coming back home to, uh, to Russian mothers, uh, th that could also uh, lead to uh, uh, a lot of domestic unrest w within Russia. Uh, but for now, uh, it is what it is. We've got a war. And the question for uh, investors, uh, when we can focus on these things, is uh, what does it all uh, mean? Well, um, it could very well be that uh, the stock market will uh, climb a wall of worry, as they say. Uh, the only problem is on the other side of the wall, there's a, a horrible war going on. And until uh, we have some uh, clarity, until the fog of war clears up and we see where this thing is, uh, is going, uh, that's uh, going to complicate things for the market. Um, I think for the uh, economy, uh, within the past uh, several days, uh, uh, the consensus view has changed uh, quite significantly on where the economy is going. I think before, you know, uh, before the day of infamy, February 24th, uh, one can say that uh, uh, there was lots of uh, evidence uh, certainly pointing to uh, high inflation, but uh, you could still hold on to the notion that some of that was related to supply chain disruptions 
and that as they clear it up, that uh, we would get to peak inflation within the next few months. Uh, and we were thinking for the consumption deflator uh, core, excluding food and energy, that we'd see a, a peak uh, within the next few months. Uh, so let's say by March of something in the neighborhood of five to 6%. Uh, again, this was before the, uh, the invasion, Putin's war. And uh, then we thought that uh, it could moderate down to maybe uh, three to 4% by the end of the year, wouldn't get down to 2% because rent inflation would be coming up, but consumer durables goods inflation would come down and that would give us some uh, relief on the, uh, uh, on the inflation front. And in that scenario, the Fed, uh, we thought would increase the Fed funds rate uh, four times. We weren't in the camp of five, six, 7% uh, increases. We felt that uh, 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 this Fed wouldn't do a Volcker 2.0 given uh, that kind of uh, scenario. Uh, and we were using uh, 4,800 as uh, the year-end target for the S&P 500, which was basically unchanged since the beginning of the year. Uh, and uh, just uh, like everybody else talked about uh, uh, lots of volatility up, up and down and the trading market. And uh, uh, you know we could certainly live with that uh, for a year before the market uh, resumed its uh, upward course, uh, assuming that the bull market uh, is still intact, which I do. Well, then February 24th hit and uh, the, the world changed, uh, I think, uh, uh, quite uh, dramatically. I don't want to overreact to events because uh, clearly it's, uh, the, the, it is hard to predict how things will uh, unfold here. Uh, but typically uh, wars like this don't just uh, end, uh, stop on a dime and uh, suddenly just uh, everything looks uh, good again. Uh, th this one is going to continue probably longer than uh, we would have expected and, uh, or hoped. Uh, and uh, create uh, more uh, geopolitical uh, uh, repercussions. By the way, they don't have to be uh, bad. It could be that uh, you know, uh, this will be the kind of the last hurrah of uh, Vladimir uh, Putin if it goes really bad, for, continues to go bad for him, uh, and he continues to threaten using nuclear uh, uh, weapons. Uh, there could be uh, a coup. Uh, maybe that's extreme wishful thinking. Uh, Again, he's a KGB agent, so he certainly knows how to surround himself with lots of protection. Uh, even Zelensky's uh, had three attempts on, on his life, uh, according to the information that uh, is uh, is in the media, and has dodged those uh, those bullets. So he's certainly got a lot of people protecting him. Uh, but it could be the last hurrah for for uh, Putin. Uh, maybe even China will conclude that uh, invading Taiwan uh, has a lot of downsides, given the way the world has reacted with revulsion to what the Russians, uh, Putin has done and to uh, the uh, consequences it's, it's had in uh, uh, economic uh, uh, losses and uh, human uh, disasters, both in terms of casualties and, and lost lives. So uh, it's conceivable that um, Putin's uh, BFF, best friend forever, uh, President Xi, Xi of uh, China will, uh, Give him a call and said, you know, this is this has got to stop. It's uh, it's 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 killing the the global economy. It's leading to soaring uh, oil and food prices. So this is coming uh, to have an impact on us, and this this has got to stop. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of things that can happen here, uh, but in terms of what we know, there's still a war going on. Uh, the um, the Ukrainians are putting up a, a, a remarkable uh, resistance. Uh, so before we had um, evidence of what one could call an inflationary boom uh, for the U.S. economy, uh, now uh, with the uh, events of the past uh, couple of weeks, uh, I think an, a stagflation uh, is uh, becoming the word that uh, describes things. So suddenly it's looking more like uh, the great inflation of the 1970s. Uh, 1970s, we had just a, a run of bad luck and a run of bad policy making, and we had some geopolitical uh, crises like two oil shocks uh, that uh, included a war in the Middle East, and those oil shocks led to uh, higher inflation and uh, slower growth, uh, hence the word stagflation. Uh, that certainly uh, seems to be an increasingly likely scenario uh, for the U.S. economy. Uh, of course, stagflation, uh, it means higher inflation than we thought before and uh, lower growth than we thought before. It doesn't rule out a recession. Uh, I think before February 24th, uh, very few of us would have thought that there's a likelihood of a recession this year. Uh, but now with deja vu all over again, we're seeing oil prices spike up. 
and oil prices spiking up ha does have a uh, history of being associated if, uh, with recessions, if not causing recessions. Uh, that certainly has to be something on our radar screens. Uh, certainly, uh, Europe uh, is uh, much more likely to fall into recession, even if they continue to um, uh, pump gas out of Russia and uh, they continue to take gas uh, from Russia and Europe and pay for it. Even if that happens, uh, we are talking about um, a continued upward pressure or, uh, or a continued high prices, very high prices uh, for oil and gas. And uh, uh, of course, much will depend, uh, is, will depend uh, on how things go day by day in the war. Uh, if the atrocities uh, uh, pick up, uh, then uh, the policy uh, of the policies of Europe and, and the West generally uh, could change pretty radically towards, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're putting sanctions on everything except what we need uh, from Russia. And at some point it may get to the point where uh, we just have to uh, take, take the pain of uh, what really is in some ways a, a world war uh, already, at least it's a world war economic war. Uh, and so that's a possibility. So I uh, can't rule out a recession. Uh, so uh, it's hard to hold on to the notion that the market just kind of go kind of go sideways with uh, with volatility and lowering my S&P 500. Joe and I are lowering our uh, target for the S&P 500 uh, from 4,800 this year uh, to 4,000 uh, by the end of the year. And then next year, uh, we're keeping our uh, optimistic bent. Uh, as, as, as you know, we have that uh, psychological defect. We, we, we tend to look for reasons to be optimistic, uh, though we try to be realistic as, as we're trying to do right here. But uh, with regards to uh, the target for the S&P 500 2023, uh, we're using now, um, instead of 5,200, uh, we're using uh, 5,000 for the end of uh, next year. So uh, that's what we're thinking in terms of uh, an institutional portfolio, uh, we would continue to underweight bonds. Um, I know they uh, do well when there's a flight to quality and uh, risk off mentality, which, we, which has been occurring the past several days. Um, but I think that uh, the Fed is going to proceed uh, with rate increases. Uh, I think they're going to be baby step uh, rate increases of 25 each. Uh, I'm not quite sure how they get sprink sprinkled over the rest of the year, but I think it, it's uh, four, four increases uh, to 1%. So I'm not changing uh, that outlook. Uh, but uh, the inflation outlook uh, certainly changes uh, with the uh, surge in uh, commodity prices we're seeing. Uh, and so now we're thinking something more like uh, six to 7% uh, peak inflation and not by March, but uh, maybe by, uh, by, by, the, by the middle of the year. Uh, and then we don't get down to three to 4%, uh, we get down to four to 5% uh, by the end of the year. Um, I think uh, we all know the Fed is way behind the inflation curve, but uh, given the geopolitical uncertainties, I think the Fed's gonna be very uh, careful about how it does things. Um, so, um, in terms of the equity portfolio, uh, continue to uh, underweight energy, even if, uh, uh, I mean, this is just total madness, as, as you may have seen in the, uh, the title of uh, our morning briefing is, it's a mad, 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 mad world. Uh, it was actually a very funny movie way back when, but there's nothing funny about the madness that we're, we're, we're seeing now, but it is the height of madness to, uh, to think that this administration is scrambling to try to get a deal with Iran the mad mullahs of Iran, uh, so that they'll pump out a million barrels per day. Uh, when, by the way, we could uh, probably do that uh, overnight if uh, if we wanted to here, uh, if, and we had a, a, a friendlier environment uh, for doing so. Um, well, uh, but it is what it is, and um, the um, implications are that uh, energy will continue to do well. Uh, I don't know if climate activism uh, will. Uh, uh, get a significant setback uh, from what's going on here, because clearly uh, uh, one of the reasons that uh, we have this crisis is because uh, uh, Putin knew that uh, oil is not just a commodity, it's a geopolitical uh, asset, it's a, it's a strategic tool. And um, so uh, uh, I, I think there, there's some people waking up to the realization that uh, you can't just go from uh, uh, dirty, uh, uh, fuel to clean uh, resources uh, in, in a short order as, the, the, as has been tried. 
Uh, and certainly it makes no sense whatsoever to talk about madness uh, for the Germans and the Europeans to have concluded that uh, their best contribution to climate change is to uh, uh, shut down their nuclear reactors in Germany, cut back their coal production, cut back their uh, gas production, and, and instead of burning their dirty fuel, they're going to burn Russia's dirty fuel. Now, how does that make any sense whatsoever? Um, and uh, again, how does it make any sense for America to have a, a, a climate policy that says, okay, we're not going to produce it, but we're going to import it from Iran and burn their dirty fuel? Um, again, makes no sense. Uh, I think there's even a story that uh, we're scrambling to Venezuela trying to get uh, them to produce more oil. So uh, it's, uh, there's still lots of uh, madness and insanity going on there at the policy uh, level. But energy gets uh, a boost from all that and energy is still uh, a relatively small uh, sector in the S&P 500. Uh, and I think it's, um, it's, it's a good hedge against inflation, a good hedge against rising interest rates I still feel as, an, as the financials. I know the financials have gotten hit partly because of the sanctions and what impact that might have on uh, some of the credit systems, but so far it doesn't seem to be creating any sort of uh, global financial crisis. Uh, and uh, if you don't wanna take your chances in the big cap uh, financials, uh, uh, look at some of the smaller cap re regionals that uh, do well when interest rates are rising. And I think, as I said, the Fed funds rate goes up and I think the bond yield goes up. Uh, to two and a half percent by the end of the year. Could be wrong on that because the, the, there's something funky going on in that bond market, but uh, the Fed is about to stop buying uh, securities uh, and uh, it's about to start raising interest rates slowly. And I think that'll put some more upward pressure on the bond market along with inflationary pressures. Um, then what about technology? Well, um, uh, clearly, uh, the valuation multiples are, uh, are are losing some air here. They're, they're coming down. Uh, but I think as they do so, uh, technology still is the name of the game uh, for the uh, rest of the decade. I know it sounds crazy to uh, talk about the roaring 2020s, but things change as we, you know, who really anticipated the kind of insanity we're seeing now at the beginning of the year? And yet there were thousands of soldiers on the border with the Ukraine. And uh, what could we have been thinking that, uh, you know, uh, Putin was just threatening and wasn't going to use those forces, especially when now, with the benefit of hindsight, we all know there was a speech he gave in July of last year. Uh, actually, it was an essay that he wrote, 5,000 word essay, uh, basically spelling this all out, what he intended to do and his complaints and, and why he felt he was in the right. Uh, so uh, it, is, it is what it is. So with that, let me uh, uh, take you real quick through the, the charts. I can find them here. Yeah, there they are. Okay, just a couple of quick uh, charts. Uh, obviously, I spend more time uh, doing my monologue. But uh, remember the pandemic? Oh, those are the good old days. I mean, that's a walk in the park compared to uh, the, what, what's going on now. Uh, although clearly, uh, right now, it's more the fear factor and, and in terms of the, for, the, for most of us around the world of how this plays out than actually uh, the, the, the pandemic's effect on people's health uh, uh, near, near and dear, including ourselves. Um, I didn't get it, but um, you know, uh, we, we all know somebody who got it and some people got it really bad. But the pandemic is, uh, is over at least, at least uh, for, for now. And uh, there, I guess it was a 60 minutes show last night uh, saying that uh, as far as our virologists can tell, there are just no real serious uh, new variants out there. We did lower our GDP forecast in line with this uh, more stagflationary environment. Instead of two and a half to 3%, we just kind of flattened that to uh, 2% uh, across the board. Um, the concern obviously is uh, with uh, uh, gasoline prices and food prices going up, fuel prices going up, uh, that that's going to uh, weigh on consumer spending. And so we have higher inflation being a, a cause of uh, slower growth. And here you can see gasoline uh, per household, uh, gasoline spending per household is available through December. And that was uh, $3,100 $3, uh, at an annual rate. And we know that the price of gasoline has gone up about 60% uh, since the beginning of the year. So that implies that uh, this number is very quickly going to go to something like uh, 
dare I say, $5,000 at an annual rate. That's an extra $2,000 in spending on gasoline. Uh, look, I got five kids and two of them are in college. And even the college kids have, have started to complain about inflation, what it costs them to fill up their tank and what the food costs at the grocery store. So if they notice it, inflation is, is really out there. Uh, food uh, prices, uh, here you can see uh, food consumption per household. And uh, you can see that uh, if you just uh, do a trend here, uh, we should be more like at $16,000 per year. Instead, we're at 17,000. So I, I figure inflation is at least $1,000 more. I know it feels like even more than that, but uh, maybe it is more than that, but it, it, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's higher. It's, so let's say that the consumers have to spend at least another $3,000 extra just to pay for the inflation and gasoline and food. Uh, that hurts, uh, that hurts a lot of people. Uh, the good news at first when the employment numbers came out is we did our earned income proxy, which is a good proxy for uh, uh, wages and salaries and personal income as, as, uh, as you can see here, this is wages and salaries and personal income. This is uh, the uh, earned income proxy reflecting employment and wages. But when you adjust for inflation, things are starting to look uh, pr pretty slow, uh, even flattish. So again, um, the notion of uh, stagflation, higher inflation, causing slower economic growth. Uh, meanwhile, we're still uh, surprisingly on an upward trend of 1.2% for inflation adjusted wages. So that's so some good news. Uh, of course, we had a lot of good news in the employment release, a very strong uh, pay payroll employment, uh, solid household employment, particularly encouraged to see that uh, uh, full-time household employment uh, is now at an all-time record high. And you can see it got there very, very quickly. So this has been a V-shaped recovery from this lockdown recession we had back here compared to the, the previous uh, history of these things. So uh, I don't think uh, we're, you know, I'm, I'm not into the recession camp at this point. Uh, ask me again if price of oil gets to 150 and uh, some other bad things happen along the way here. Um, if we get uh, a real uh, lack of supply of, of, the, of, of energy and we get some real problems, uh, even more problems in food, uh, apparently, Odessa is uh, under attack right now, and uh, Odessa is uh, one of the, is the major port uh, for uh, Ukraine to ship um, wheat and other commodities. And so, the impact on global food prices is uh, is uh, going to be is startling, and will continue to be startling. And remember the Arab Spring that was caused by higher food prices, higher uh, grain prices. Well, we th this may have more more global ramifications faster uh, than just uh, staying local within uh, the Eastern European area. Uh, meanwhile, we still have uh, labor shortages, uh, uh, though I'm some people are telling me that uh, some of these labor shortages are because of uh, employers hoarding labor and not really having that much work for them to do. I, I just anecdotally am hearing that. Uh, so we'll see whether that plays out and suddenly uh, a much slower pace of hiring. But right now, everything looks like there's still enough strength in the US economy uh, to justify using stagflation instead of just an outright uh, inflationary recession. Uh, I'll have to figure out a word for that one. But uh, look at uh, durable goods orders uh, for non-defense capital goods, just absolutely soaring, uh, reflecting our view that companies are dealing with labor shortages by spending on uh, equipment. You might wanna look at industrial equipment uh, as a good place to invest, because uh, uh, this suggests that the profits are absolutely phenomenal. Um, but meanwhile, the price of uh, oil continues to go up. Um, the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, which is very heavily weighted uh, by oil, is uh, is going up. Uh, and in addition to energy, uh, grains are are soaring. That's the the, the blue line there. Um, and so the, uh, the the charts basically just uh, explain why stagflation is uh, the scenario that makes sense here, higher inflation and um, a lower, slower economic growth. Let me uh, turn that off and let me go here to the Q&A. Is stagflation now the base, best case scenario? The short answer is yes. The long answer I just gave you. Uh, you're expecting, this is uh, expecting minus 6.5% S&P 500 returns between now and year end. Where do you recommend allocating assets today? I think I did that for you. So some of these questions came in at the beginning of my talk. Uh, so I think I covered that uh, uh, energy is a hedge against inflation, 
financials hedge against uh, rising interest rates. If uh, you're worried about the sanctions impact on the global uh, credit crisis, uh, stay with some of the smaller cap names. Uh, Smith, Smith caps uh, look really cheap to me. And so uh, energy, financials, technologies, the Smith caps uh, look particularly interesting. Uh, this one from David, uh, how have you revised your earnings estimates for S&P 500? For, I'm, uh, David, I'm glad you asked me about my earnings estimates. So uh, we're finishing that up right now. It'll be uh, uh, available tomorrow, uh, well, this afternoon in the advanced copy of the morning briefing. Uh, the short answer is, believe it or not, we're not changing. Uh, our, uh, we're raising our revenues estimates because of more inflation. We're not changing our uh, uh, earnings numbers. Uh, what we're really doing here is just, uh, uh, you know, uh, slashing the 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 the, uh, the, the PE uh, instead of uh, uh, the the happy-go-lucky uh, wishful thinking that we hang around 19 to 20 on the forward PE this year. Um, we're cutting that to 16. I think last I saw we were at uh, a little around 19 at the end of uh, last week. So uh, we're cutting that to 16. So uh, with higher inflation, higher interest rates, uh, we think that's uh, that's that's the appropriate thing to do, and that's how we get uh, from 4,800 to 4,000, and then we bounce uh, right back without really changing our earnings uh, by concluding that the roaring 2020s will be back, be back next year. Um, it's an old forecasting trick. If something doesn't work this year and you still believe in it, push it on into next year. But I, I do think that there's still some uh, reason for optimism here, even. This may geopolitically play out uh, surprisingly well uh, in terms of uh, substantially reducing the risks of the Chinese going in against Taiwan and uh, uh, maybe uh, really giving some real strength to the forces of uh, democracy and freedom. I mean, uh, we'll, we can talk about that another time. Uh, let's see, Doug, uh, do you still think inflation eventually moderates to 2 to 3% after the commodity Price spike. Uh, I don't think. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, even before this all happened, we thought that inflation will get down to three to four percent by the end of the year, and we doubted that uh, we get it back down to two percent. The idea was that consumer durables inflation would uh, come down, but rent inflation would go up. Uh, so three to four percent seemed about as optimistic as we could uh, realistically get. Um, and um, then I thought that uh, well, the Fed could always move the goalpost and uh, make the uh, inflation target 3% instead of 2%. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that all plays, plays out. But no, I don't, I don't think two to three is realistic. Uh, Rocco, uh, given the S&P 500 target cut to 4,000, how did your probabilities of roaring 20s versus stagflation change? If I remember well, last the update was 60% versus 40%. Yeah, the, you know, the, the, the problem with that uh, stag that disinflation Sorry, let's do that again. The problem with the notion of the roaring 2020s versus the um, inflationary 1970s and, and talking about uh, uh, these two as alternative scenarios for an entire decade isn't a, a realistic way to look at it. Uh, it can obviously be some combination of, uh, of both for a while. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, right now, it certainly looks a lot more like, you know, almost all looks 100% like uh, uh, the uh, great inflation of the 1970s. It's hard to make a, a, a much of a case for uh, uh, pulling out data confirming the uh, roaring 2020s. Um, though the labor market's doing really well and capital spending is very strong and I think productivity is there. So in other words, I still think there's data there, there that, that, it's, that the underlying process of the roaring 20s is still very much intact, uh, but uh, the focus uh, right now, of course, is on the, the great inflation. Uh, I think, uh, you know, right now it's, uh, you know, if it was 60, 40, 60s, the, the happy story and 40% the not so happy story, now it's kind of uh, more like 50, 50, depending on how things uh, fold, uh, unfold in the, um, okay, I'll be uh, realistic. It's, it's more like 60%, the unhappy story of the 1970s and 40%, the, the happy story of the roaring 2020s. Um, I think uh, as, as time passes, as this war uh, ends and uh, we see how things kind of shake out, I'd say the roaring uh, 2020s will, will be back as, a, as the most likely scenario. Um, what are your views on the commodity stocks representing copper, iron ore, grains, and of course, oil? Um, 
if you own them, stay with them. Uh, I know that uh, it could be, you know, anytime you see a price going straight up uh, in commodity markets, the next thing it does is it goes straight down. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a lot of volatility in this market. Uh, but I think uh, given that uh, Ukraine and Russia are such important uh, pr uh, providers of uh, uh, commodities, um, this is going to be very disruptive in the commodity markets uh, for a while. And uh, while we should be have not much problems getting top rotted chili, uh, higher uh, energy prices increase the cost of uh, smelting uh, these uh, metals and uh, have a tendency to cause the smelters to be shut down for economic reasons. So uh, and, uh, Melissa Tag uh, is working on a research project on the commodities right now, and we should have that for you uh, uh, Wednesday. So look, look for that. I'll be more informed uh, by then. Uh, what are your views? Okay. Um, love your weekly webcam. Thank you, John. Uh, some investment questions. Given the higher inflation expectations, gold, both the price and gold miners, uh, which commodities besides energy, how high do you see interest rates, especially if rush? Uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, gold uh, uh, certainly is, is part of the equation here in terms of uh, commodities. Uh, gold tends to... Uh, show the underlying trend in commodity prices. And uh, I don't know if you can call going straight up a trend, uh, but uh, that's what we're seeing here. So uh, gold has actually been a laggard and there's some opportunities for it to catch up. It's uh, very highly inversely correlated with the real tip yield, and the real tip yield has recently gone down. So that should be a good for gold and the gold miners. Uh, my friend Willem has, has got a question and I think we'll call it quits. Uh, how do you hedge against the risk of a nuclear war? <laughs> Willem, uh, potassium iodide. That's all I can tell you. Uh, get yourself some potassium iodide pills. I don't know if that'll help. Uh, Doug, what is your view of other commodity sectors? Okay, we discussed that. Uh, I think we did it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, stay safe, stay sane. Um, it's a mad, 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 mad world. Uh, uh, there's also a play that was written, that's, that's a movie that was done in the 1960s. Uh, there's also a, a Broadway show called to Stop the World I Want to Get Off, uh, but uh, we're all in this together and uh, uh, hopefully the forces of light will uh, prevail over the forces of darkness. I'll leave you with that thought for the week. Uh, all the best.